Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Stephen from the Illinois State Water Survey, the U of I, and uh, you're joining our private well webinar, uh, Is My Water Safe to Drink? Common Questions About Private Wells. Um, we're here at the uh, State Water Survey, as I mentioned. We uh, run the private well class, which is a program funded through US EPP, and uh, we partner with the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, which I'll mention in a second, um, to run this program, and uh, they're part of the program where the, with the staff all over the country. Switch screens today, and it's messing me up. Um, so the webinar today, as I mentioned, is part of this national program with RCAP um, to support private well owners. It really supplements what we have in our private well class lessons. There is a 10 lesson class uh, that is not a webinar. Um, it's a PDF sent to you once a week for 10 weeks. Um, if you haven't signed up for the class, we certainly recommend you do. Um, and as far as this uh, webinar, um, it is being recorded and it will be eventually on YouTube. Um, to get continuing education credit, though, you have to participate live if you're an EHP or uh, someone who is um, will accept, you know, if, if your um, regulation authority accept this class for or this webinar for um, continuing education credit. Um, we did ask everyone to ask questions up front when you registered. And we've went through those and we'll answer a number of those questions um, at the end today. Um, there's also an opportunity during the webinar today for you to ask additional questions. Um, in your go to webinar window, you'll have either a chat box or a question box where you can type in questions. Um, we're monitoring that. And so if you'll put those in there, we make a list of those and at the end, we'll pop them up on the screen and go through them. Um, and so, yeah, we're here to, to try to help uh, you all uh, learn more about your well and those sorts of things. Um, if you're here for CE credit, you're, um, we're a provider through NEHA, the National Environmental Health Association. Uh, this is a common webinar that we do several times a year. And on the bottom right, I've listed the dates of the other uh, similar webinars. And so if you participate in one of those, you can't get credit again during the same credentialing cycle, which is two years for NEHA uh, for credit. So for instance, if you take the class today and your credentialing cycle just started, uh, you wouldn't be able to take the same class again from us for two years. Um, and so that's how that works. Um, you all are probably more aware of that than I am um, if you're the one getting the CEs. We also are an Illinois LEHP credit provider. And so for all those things, you can email us at info at We can get your copy of the slide deck, um, complete the forms and a certificate of attendance. Um, I will mention up front, this has become popular because it's free. And so um, sometimes it might take us a few weeks to get all of this uh, done. Um, remember, we're offering it for free and we're a small staff and it's not our mission to provide CE credit. We're not getting paid to do so. And so be patient. And uh, anyone who emails us, we will certainly get back to you um, with that information. So uh, I'm Steve Wilson, I'm a groundwater hydrologist, and um, with me today is Katie Buckley, water resource outreach specialist here at the Water Survey. She's the one who's gonna take your questions. Uh, if you put them in the question or chat box, she's also going to work with you on getting your paperwork for any CE credit. Um, we also have, uh, I just should have put that on here, I guess. Um, Sally Dolan is um, our new, she's an EHP who works here now at the survey. Um, her, she was hired because we're starting um, a hotline, a private well hotline in April. Uh, this will be on EPA's website. And so folks from will be able to ask us questions and Sally um, is going to um, manage that program. Okay, so first thing we need to do is a poll question. Um, we're really just trying to identify who our audience is, how many of your well owners versus regulators versus EHBs versus other drillers. Um, so if you would, uh, Katie, would open that. Oh, it is open, looks like. So I will leave that up for about a minute. If you would, um, please fill it out, especially if you're getting credit for today. Um, we do look at all that stuff. Um, we have a few rules we put in place on what we allow. So like if someone's only here 15 minutes and leaves, you will not get credit for the webinar today. 
Um, it's just, uh, you know, we expect you to be here and, and be a participant if you're getting CE credit for this. So please uh, fill it out. Um, it's like three fourths of you have. Katie's being extra quiet today. I'm here. <laughs> it's all good. Go about, go about five more seconds. Five seconds. Yeah. All right, I'm going to close the poll and then I will share the results. All right. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on. Maybe. All right. So I mentioned RCAP, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. So RCAP is a network of six nonprofits. These are the names of the six. They operate throughout the entire country as well as in Puerto Rico and um, Pacific territories and, and, and whatnot. Um, they each have staff who are private well, quote, experts. They, um, we have a program that's really two tiered. Um, the Water Survey and the U of I manage more of the online part of the program, like these webinars and our online class. Um, RCAP and their regional affiliates, they actually go out and work with well owners directly. They put on in-person workshops. They work with partners like uh, labs, extension, uh, county or local health districts, um, it, you know, all those type of folks. Anyone who's interested in putting on an event that'll support private well owners and helping them learn and uh, learn more about their wells, um, we're all for it. And so we all work as a team. Um, so like we're in Illinois, that's the Great Lakes Community Action Partnership. Um, their main office is in Ohio, but they have staff, they have well, four or five staff in Illinois and, and along with all the other states in the Great Lakes region. Um, and so there's two things I'll mention here in a second. There's uh, there's an assessment that they can do of your well. It's kind of like uh, for you, those of you that are with health departments do sanitary surveys for compliance for drinking water systems. It's like a sanitary survey for a private well. It's to look at what, uh, if it's properly constructed, are there issues around the well? Um, you know, does it have a solid cap? Um, look at the piping in the home, all those things to kind of to give a homeowner an idea of, hey, here's where you might be at risk if you, you know, you only have a Folgers can on top of your well instead of a, 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 a actual sealed cap, or if uh, your well's in a pit, which we still run into today, that can get flooded. You know, those are things to note and to make folks aware that uh, maybe their well isn't uh, properly constructed or up to snuff, so to speak, or other things like, um, you know, we've run into wells that are in the middle of a feedlot and, um, and other things where it's really just, it doesn't make sense to have your well exposed to, um, you know, manure and those things. So uh, the assessment's free. They do about three to 400 a year um, around the country. Um, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but uh, there's two things that you should know if you're on this webinar. One, um, if you wanna get a hold of someone from RCAP, one of the regions to uh, work together on putting uh, together a workshop for well owners, for instance, in your local jurisdiction, um, let us know. We can get you in contact with that person. Um, or you can use the number and email or uh, web address on here to do that yourself. Um, all six have a web page that's about their private well program. They also offer loans uh, through the USDA program. If you're not familiar with that, USDA has a, uh, a loan program. It's 1% it's interest, I think, um, and it's for disadvantaged homeowners. And so depending on uh, your income level, you might be able to get a loan to replace your well or um, replace even your septic or even add treatment. Um, and so they um, get money from USDA to provide those loans to people. And so that's a, it's a really great service for folks in need. And then um, lastly, um, they have, there's a well assessment that we helped develop that they could come out and do an assessment of your well in your area to give you an idea of what kind of risks there might be and if there's things you need to do uh, to make sure your drinking water is safe. So uh, very valuable uh, and it's all free. It's really nice that there's a federal program that allows us to do this work this way. And so that's like those of you getting CEs today, you know, there's no fee for this class. So it's kind of nice. 
Um, this is the first page of the well assessment, and it's actually got 18 sections, so it's pretty involved. But the idea is, you know, an assessor, someone who knows a little bit about wells uh, and uh, aquifers and those things, would come out and work with the well owner, and then go through all these things: well, water use, uh, your septic system, um, you know, what kind of treatment you have, what kind of pipes you have in your home, all that. And then in the end, they provided uh, this back to you, filled out with recommendations on things you should look at, things to consider, even like backflow devices. You know, that's not something that a lot of folks have. Um, it's a good idea, especially if you're using the water, like from a hose, from a spigot to fill a tank uh, where there might be pesticides or those sorts of things. Um, so again, it's like a sanitary survey. It's also a good way for us to spend some time one-on-one -on -one with a well owner and um, just explain what's going on with their system. And it gives the well owner a chance then to ask whatever questions they have. And so um, honestly, we've seen everything. Um, RCAP's done, uh, I think around 3,600 of these around the country already. And so it's a chance for us then to share best practices um, as well as you know, encourage communication and help well owners understand you know, who they can go to locally to get more information if they need to. Um, as I mentioned, we've done over 3,600 of these, and um, in some cases, even they were requested uh, by a state or a local jurisdiction that doesn't have the bandwidth to go out and, and investigate every well problem, and RCAP can step in and help them, and that's uh, happened a number of times. It's also a good way for uh, a local health district or a state health department or you know extension uh, person to develop that partnership with an RCAP staff person. They always be their go-to if they need, uh, have questions they can't answer. Um, these assessments, I believe, all do come with a, a water sample uh, that's free to the homeowner. And so uh, I'm not sure all the regions are doing that, but I believe they are, um, but most do. So, and um, I also wanna mention, this says on-site wastewater treatment system assessment. It's very analogous to the private well assessment, but it's specifically for your septic or on-site wastewater treatment system. You know, these days, a lot of them are more advanced. Um, they're aerobic or they remove nitrate or reduce BOD or whatever they might be. Um, and so um, we've developed working with NAURA, the National On-Site Wastewater Recycling Association, and uh, Sally, who's on our staff, who has some uh, wastewater experience or septic experience and RCAP's Wastewater Working Group, which is a group of uh, wastewater experts that they have on staff around the country. Um, we developed this very similar tool. It's also, I don't remember how many pages it is. It just came out, uh, we just finished it in October, but it's uh, really handy. It goes over all the issues related to different kinds of septic and on-site systems and provides the homeowner with a lot of good information about um, maintenance and you know, things they should be aware of and things to look for if there's ever a problem. And so, again, an RCAP staff person could come out and do one of these assessments on your on-site wastewater treatment system as well. Uh, and this is just another page of that. You know, it talks about pretreatment, advanced pretreatment, um, you know, whether it's a mound system or if it's, uh, you know, a drip system, even lagoons. You know, I, I, I mentioned a number of times when we put the well assessment together, uh, there's a small section that's about this, uh, half the size of section eight here that's on septic systems in the private well assessment, which is why we developed this. Um, but it mentions lagoons, and I had no idea that people may have a lagoon for their wastewater system uh, on a, for a private home. And uh, a number of states, including Illinois, um, do allow that in our code. So um, we all learn things um, every day. Um, so I'm at the State Water Survey. It's a, um, very proud to work here. If you've been on any of these webinars, you probably realize how I feel about that. Um, but we were formed in 1895 by the Illinois State Legislature because of cholera and typhoid outbreaks. And so in the first five or 10 years, it was basically uh, sampling every community water supply, well or surface water, and looking at the water quality of the state. And so it started in the chemistry building of the U of I, the University of Illinois, and now we're in our own facility. Um, we do a lot of applied research as well as uh, outreach and public service. We house the state's well logs uh, for, uh, we have a lab that can do water quality analysis uh, on groundwater and well samples. So we, um, our group 
just basically does everything water. Uh, the state climatologist is here. Uh, we were involved with development of the hook echo, uh, or we were the first to identify a hook echo on radar for a tornado, all kinds of cool things if you want to look at our history. But um, today we run programs like the private well class and we help communities usually around the state, but also around the country with their water quality or water quantity issues. We can do groundwater modeling, all kinds of neat stuff uh, to help uh, the public understand their resources better and what they need to do to be safe um, with their drinking water. Uh, these are some old pictures. We have, like I said, we started in 1895. So we have a ton of history about uh, the work we've always done. This is a sampling in the 1920s um, of a hand pump on a public park. These were outlawed in 1929 in Illinois, but you can see the little tin cup there where everybody just left the cup. Everybody took a drink, no one worried about it at all, no concern. The water that might be left, you know, this old uh, uh, hand pump, it works like a piston and uh, lifting water and uh, the water might set in there for two or three days, um, very likely full of bacteria. Uh, a drill rig from 1922, Weldon, Illinois is about uh, 40 miles from here. And uh, you know, this is today, um, a more recent picture from one of the drilling companies here in Illinois. Um, so drilling's gone a long way, right? Uh, the, the things we can do today, drilling wells, uh, types of wells and types of drill rigs, um, and the kind of information we can collect about uh, our aquifers and geology uh, to better understand what water quality concerns there might be. So if you're a well owner, these are the things you really need to, to I always try to point out, you know, private wells aren't regulated. A community water supply, like Champaign-Urbana, where I live now, um, it has a public water system that's regulated by the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Illinois uh, Environmental Protection Agency. That's our state primacy agency. Um, they're required to have a licensed uh, water operator. They're required to test their water regularly, and they're required to maintain the system so that when you turn on your tap, you always have water pressure, uh, all those things. If you're the well owner of a, an owner of a private well, all of those things are your responsibility. And so it's really something to take seriously and uh, to learn enough about your well that you don't have to know all the answers, but you need to know where to get the answers if you don't. You know, I, my freshman year in school, um, my undergraduates in ag engineering, a professor told me that a good engineer doesn't have all the answers. He knows where to get all the answers. And that's so true in so many things in our lives. And so uh, hopefully our class and through these webinars, you'll learn enough that at least you'll know who to ask and you'll be able to ask better questions. And so that's the goal here. Um, and also remember that water, um, it may look great, colorless, odorless, tasteless, um, that doesn't mean it's safe. You know, arsenic is a great example. We have natural occurring arsenic in some of our aquifers in Illinois. You can't see it, taste it, or smell it, um, but it's certainly there. And so the only way to be sure is to test, okay? Um, and what I pay now, I, I always swear I'm gonna change this slide, it probably works better not to. Um, that 40 or $50 was, you know, six, eight years ago before my daughter got old enough to take half hour to 45 minute showers every day. Um, that's now more 70 to 90. Um, but that's the cost that we have um, spread out over all the residents in Champaign-Urbana and Savoy for sampling, maintenance, infrastructure, all the things I mentioned. Uh, but again, um, it's your responsibility if you're a well owner. Uh, to make sure that you are doing all those things. I even recommend to people, you know, uh, a well and a pump, especially is a mechanical device, it's gonna eventually fail. And so um, you should pay yourself a water bill every month, um, whether that's 10 or $20 or whatever, and put it somewhere so that when your pump does fail, it might be in 10 years or 30 years, um, you have the resources to replace it because, you know, it's, it's pretty much sticker shock to get a bill for three to five thousand dollars because your pump failed, depending on where you're at in the country and how deep your well is, and what kind of pump you have, um, they can be uh, even much more than that. So uh, it's uh, it's really not something to you know put to chance, if you will. Um, what we hope to get out of this is help make well owners more aware. You need to understand your well log uh, and find it if you don't have a, your well log. Find out if your local health district or your state agency that regulates wells has that information. Uh, unfortunately, about half the time, you're not gonna find your well log. Um, 
I know uh, in some states it's even worse than that. Uh, their rules came along later and uh, they weren't as strict. And so in some states you may not uh, have a lot of wells on file. But knowing how deep your well is, where your pump set, and if you have a screen or not, are key things to understanding what type of well you have, um, what where your water's coming from. You know, if you know that your well is 160 foot deep and it's got a screen, then it's a sand and gravel well in all likelihood. And there's an aquifer down at 160 feet. Um, how thick that is, um, you know, you can usually find um, logs that will show that how thick the aquifer is or your state resource agency, either DNR or uh, DEQ or it depends. Um, or your state geological survey or USGS will have that information. They've got maps of the geology of, of every state. Um, a lot of times they can tell you how deep it is to a certain aquifer and how thick it is. And knowing that stuff helps you understand, you know, if you're at an aquifer that's at 160 feet and there's glacial till, which is more like clay and doesn't let water through very well, then you're very unlikely to have surface contamination get in your well because the only place water is coming in your well is at the screen versus a bedrock well, it could be 600 feet deep. But if bedrock's only 30 feet below land surface, then you might only have 40 or 50 feet of casing, if that. And that means water can get in the well anywhere from 40 or 50 feet on below. And depending on how old it is, if it was properly constructed. So um, understanding your log, it's a place to start and uh, on your well and how it's constructed and where the water's coming from. And then um, you can also ask your resource agency, like your state geological survey or USGS, um, if they know of any naturally occurring contaminants or water quality issues. If someone calls me, um, I can tell them, you know, we have the Muhammad Aquifer in central Illinois, which runs from the Indiana state line to the Illinois River about two thirds of the way west through the state uh, that covers 11 counties and it's known to have arsenic in it. And it's a hit or miss when you drill a well there, whether it does, but at least it's something that you can tell a homeowner that they need to look out for and, and, and test for at least once to make sure um, that w whether it's there or not. So it uh, also this helps you learn to ask the right questions and know what sources of information there are. And lastly, you know, our uh, main message is you need to sample your well water um, annually for nitrate and coliform and every three to five years for a list that I'll give you here in a little bit. It's uh, the only way to know for sure that you're well safe. Even if your water tested safe, um, you know, you hit a, a stand up pipe on your well, the, the well head that sticks up, with a tractor or a mower, uh, you might crack it uh, and not even know it, or one of your kids might have done that, you know, sort of thing. And so the only way to know for sure is to regularly test. So uh, probably the most common questions we get are right here um, about sampling, where to collect it, what to test for, um, where to get it analyzed, um, what to do with the results when you get them, you know, all that. We have people who tell us they don't want to sample their wear well because then what are they going to do? They don't have the money for testing or for treatment necessarily or whatever. And so they just let it go, uh, which is not the way to do things. So uh, collecting your sample. So the water coming out of your kitchen sink um, is likely where you get your drinking water for cooking. And most of the time, uh, if you get a glass of water, either that or, you know, these days, a lot of folks have those on their fridge. Um, which have an own internal filter. Um, but this water coming out of your kitchen tap is very different from the water that's coming uh, into the house from the well. That's because it sits in pipes. You might have a softener, a filter, um, you know, a number of things. And so um, what we ask, we what we try to do, so going back a little bit, until 2008, the Illinois State Water Survey offered free water testing for any Illinois resident with a private well. And so uh, that was state funded. And so we could send people two sample kits. So we had them collect one at their kitchen tap and one um, at an outside spigot close to the well before any kind of treatment. Uh, and usually you let that run for 15 or 20 minutes until you're sure the pump's kicked on in the well. So you're getting fresh groundwater. And that helps us as scientists understand what the groundwater quality is versus what your drinking water quality is. Because like I mentioned, they're very different. Um, and knowing things like if you have lead pipes in your home or galvanized pipes, or if they're copper pipes with lead solder, solder you know, lead-free wasn't really lead-free with solder until 2014. 
Um, and so, and Illinois has the distinction of being the last state to not allow lead pipes in 1986. And so, um, you know, it's very likely uh, that an older home will have uh, some lead uh, in the piping system unless it's PVC. So, and then knowing what kind of treatment devices you have and what they remove. Um, and when you call a lab to get a sample kit or and all that stuff, a lab should be able to provide you detailed instructions. Um, a lot, a lot of them these days will send you a, um, a UPS uh, box with the bottles in it and instructions and instructions on how to label the samples and send them back. Um, but it's really important uh, that you follow those closely if you do that. So as far as where to sample, again, we suggest an inside tap, uh, typically the kitchen tap where you're going to get your drinking water, as well as an outside spigot. Um, I've already mentioned this, I guess, it's because it's a representative of natural tap water. Um, we don't offer free sampling anymore. In fact, um, our lab is uh, just discontinued um, its service for private well owners. They basically are just in support of the research that we do here now. And so um, you need to find a private lab um, that'll do this work. Uh, it's going to cost you for both samples. And so we certainly don't expect people to collect uh, two sets of samples. If you're really interested in learning about um, what your water quality is coming into your home so that you can better design or someone can better design treatment for that, uh, that's a, that's the best way to go. But uh, the water can be really different. And I'm going to show you an example uh, just so you understand what I'm talking about here. Um, so this is a, a well that's in the Muhammad Aquifer. I mentioned this, which is here. It's 240 feet. It has a screen. So all the water is coming from that depth. And this is the raw sample from an outside spigot. And the things to note here um, are like the, the sodium is 25.9 in the first column and iron is 2.99, which is pretty high. Um, and then on the right side, uh, down below the turbidity is really high, 29 color. It's got a lot of color. It has a little bit of a hydrogen sulfide odor and the hardness is 351. Okay, so this person has a filter and a softener. And what that did to the water, just taking a sample after the filter and softener at the kitchen tap, the sodium went way up from, 50, from 25 to 198. That's because they're using regular salt, uh, sodium chloride salt in their water softener. Not a huge deal, but if you're someone who's on a low sodium diet, that, that might be an unintended consequence of uh, doing that. But at the same time, uh, it lowered the turbidity and color and the hardness went from 351 to 0.68, which, you know, that's what the softener is supposed to do, right? It's supposed to remove the hardness. And so uh, this is a good example of how different that could be. And for this particular sample, uh, this gentleman actually added a RO, a reverse osmosis unit, um, at the kitchen tap. And so after running through the RO as well, it took almost everything out. The less than symbols, the, the left facing arrows mean less than, and that's the detection limit for all of those uh, constituents. But it even, it took the sodium down to 6.24, uh, you know, it reduced the hardness. One thing I forgot to mention uh, on the first two was the pH is around eight of this water. And even after going through the softener and the filter, it's still uh, about eight. But when you remove all these minerals, some of them are buffering the water uh, the pH was lowered to 6.23. So that's another unintended consequence. The water went from a little bit alkaline to a little bit acidic. Um, not a huge deal, but it could affect, um, especially if you had a whole house system, uh, which we certainly don't recommend for arsenic removal, but um, a whole house RO system will um, could make the water more aggressive or corrosive and affect your um, lead and copper a little more if you have lead or copper pipes. So it really makes a difference and you need to understand that, um, you know, our advice to everyone would be sample at your kitchen tap. Uh, that's where you're getting your drinking water from. And that's where you're ingesting most of the water. Um, and so you want to know what you're drinking and putting in your body. And so that's probably the most important. So um, and what else uh, to test for then? You know, it really is. Every situation can be different. And knowing the depth of your well, what formation, which the geologic formation is coming from, if there's any information available, again, from the state resource agency or the USGS on contaminants that might be in those aquifers, uh, you need to ask. Um, 
county and state health departments or local health districts and those resource agencies, they are there for you. Um, you need to have, uh, being a little inquisitive can go a long way as far as understanding uh, what your natural water quality might be. Uh, you can also ask, uh, you know, that every state, uh, well, every state but two license drillers and have well construction code, but I think most states or every state tracks uh, wells that are drilled. And so if you can, if you just Google, you know, my state well log, water well logs, you'll come up like in Missouri, it's DNR, and you come up with a site where you can go and look and help try to find your log. In Illinois, that's our state water survey or state geological survey. We both share those records. And we actually have an online tool where you can zoom into your uh, where you live on a map and it'll show you all the wells that we have records for. And uh, so that's helpful as well as then uh, other folks that might be able to help you with be co-op extension in your local area, especially in rural areas. So um, what we recommend is sampling for coliform and nitrate annually. They indicate a pathway into your well. And what I mean by that is, you know, nitrate should be low in groundwater. I know there's cases where there's contamination of an aquifer from, uh, you know, in Nebraska, they have a real problem with nitrate uh, in the shallower aquifers because of all the farming and irrigation. Um, and also coliform bacteria shouldn't be present in your well. And so these are easy, simple tests that if nitrate's elevated or you have coliform, it usually indicates there's a pathway into your well, which means there's a breach somewhere near the surface. You're not gonna find coliform at 160 feet. Um, it doesn't exist naturally in groundwater. It can survive for a few days, but it doesn't live there. And so if you, uh, that means it's gotta be coming from a shallow source. And so if you have coliform in that well and it's 160 feet deep, that means there's either a crack in the casing, uh, there's some bugs or other things that have found their way into your well uh, cap, um, or there's some other, uh, something's, um, it usually means there's a crack in the casing or the casing isn't sealed uh, near the surface because those things are usually found closer to the surface. Um, and so that's why we say that. If you test for coliform and nitrate, and they're both negative, that does not mean your water is safe to drink. Um, you could have arsenic or uranium or some other natural occurring contaminant. Um, it, again, it's it's a good test to understand that your well's probably properly constructed or it's in an area where you're not gonna find those things, but um, you still need to test uh, for other things to make sure your water is safe overall. So as an example, um, why you test for other things. Um, this is Rhode Island and all the little dots are where there used to be orchards where through the 60s they used arsenic based pesticides um, to protect their crops. Now all of these areas have soil contamination from arsenic based pesticides and some of the shallow groundwater systems in these areas do too. And so Rhode Island put up this map, uh, the Department of Health, and so it's to identify those areas and to help people understand that if you're in an area near an old orchard or you, there's, um, there's probably a list on their webpage of actual addresses, um, you probably should test for arsenic if you have a shallow well. Um, the big splotch in the middle though, that is where there's high natural occurring beryllium. And when I found this probably 10 years ago, um, I didn't know beryllium was even a uh, contaminant, um, but it is, it's listed under the Safe Drinking Water Act as a, uh, as a constituent that causes health effects. And so community water supplies have to test for it to make sure it's not in their water supply. Um, I'd never recommend this on a national scale. Um, I'd not heard of beryllium being in groundwater until then. There's probably other few areas in the country where that may occur. That's why you have to ask. You know, uh, Rhode Island is a small state, 30 by 40 miles. Uh, we have counties that big in Illinois. And so um, understanding that you need to ask is the point here. Um, there, who knows if there's something unusual or not as common uh, in your groundwater that just might be there because of the way the rocks were formed and the bedrock aquifers or whatever. You know, there's states, uh, we interviewed uh, 40 states for a project in the late uh, 1910s, I guess, and seven states said they had no arsenic issue at all in their state. Most states do, we do in Illinois, but not everyone does. And so that's why I say it depends on where you live, depends on what the constituents are. 
Um, there's also help without even having to call necessarily. Uh, for Massachusetts, they've uh, done enough sampling that they know where there's arsenic and uranium issues in their bedrock aquifers. So they set up this website. So if you have a private bedrock well, you type in your address, it'll tell you whether um, they believe you're at risk for arsenic or, or uranium uh, contamination. Pretty helpful because uh, especially the uranium test isn't that cheap. Um, and so it gives you an idea of what you might need to do. Uh, and then there's resources available through the uh, Mass DEP to help you with um, if you did need to add treatment and some of those things. And then lastly, here's a more advanced version. This is Wisconsin and DNR is the primacy agency in Wisconsin. And they've collected enough water samples that they're able to put together this uh, map. And you can search by county or township or even by section, um, which is a square mile. And so I searched by county for arsenic, uh, the little guide up at the top right. Uh, you can pick your constituent. And so what it shows is that there's a number of counties that are clear, right? That don't like in the upper by Duluth, that county doesn't have any color. And it means there's no, they've had no samples there yet. But um, all the other counties have some value based on, a, on samples. Um, I could tell you that today, this slide, I took a screenshot. This is probably six or eight years old, um, but it still proves a point. Um, this map's different today because they have a lot more samples. But what this highlights is that near Green Bay, where the three red counties are, um, the average arsenic concentration for wells they've sampled there is over 21, which the health limit for a community water supply, they can't provide water to people that are over 10. And so the yellow, orange, and red are all areas where uh, the samples they've collected, at least to date, uh, at, when this was done, um, have arsenic at higher than that level. That's good to know. If I'm going to get a job in Green Bay and I'm going to move up there, um, that's something that I'm going to do if I'm looking for a home. If I want to get a home out in the country, it doesn't, or, or, or that has a private well, it doesn't mean I'm not going to but it means I'm going to require a test first before I uh, look at it um, and really seriously considering uh, purchasing. So, um, but really helpful, especially if you live in Wisconsin, you can look this information up. So here's what we suggest. Um, again, annually for coliform nitrate, and I mentioned in here, Penn State suggests 14 months. It's actually a good idea. You know, some things are a little bit seasonal, especially with shallow wells or older wells that might be hand dug or bored. And so uh, Penn State's uh, rationale here is that if you're actually going to do it every year like you're supposed to, then if you do it over 14 months, um, it'll change the seasons over the course of six years, That's right? So now you've sampled in January, March, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so you get, a, uh, if there's any differences because of seasons, you're, it's going to show up over time. And so it's actually not a bad idea. Um, but we still recommend annually. Uh, just do it once a year, make sure you know it's it's not like somebody does it on the same day every year anyway, right? And then we recommend testing for this list of constituents. And again, we try to put this together as kind of a national audience. And so it's not going to look at some of the specific things like beryllium in Rhode Island, which if I was in uh, Rhode Island, I'd recommend you sample for beryllium. And so that's why at the end we say uh, get advice from your local or state health department because it's important to know locally what might be going on. You know, geology is complicated. How all the material was laid uh, in the ground before we had glaciers, you know, million years ago is all, uh, yeah, it's all, all different. So understanding natural water quality as well as understanding, like if you have galvanized pipes, galvanized pipes have zinc, cadmium, and lead. And so um, you'd certainly want to test for those things. Um, so, yeah. And this gives you overall a good idea of the general chemistry of your groundwater or your you know, water you're drinking, which um, we say every three to five years because what we've learned is many things that are natural occurring like manganese or iron, um, if it's really high uh, today, in five years, it's likely to be really high. Um, and so some of these things won't change much, but if they do, then there's something else going on. Um, for instance, if all of a sudden, um, you know, a value changed, it could be because there's been a crack open up in your pipe of or your well uh, casing, and now um, some other water's getting in, it's changed the chemistry. Um, and that's the only way you'd ever know uh, that that might be happening. 
So when to test, we certainly recommend, uh, you know, besides what we said before, anytime that you've opened the well, you're, you're up making the opportunity to uh, introduce things into the well. Um, once you've disinfected a well, if you had to, you should always take a follow-up sample to make sure that the disinfection worked. Um, if you had to shock chlorinate, for instance. And um, after you've added treatment, should be on here too. Uh, but obviously after an emergency response event, so flood or a fire, you know, a well casing, um, the cap's meant to be watertight. Uh, a lot of them have a vent tube. Um, many, especially in a cold climate, uh, they all have a gasket. You know, on this picture, this was obviously a fire. And the point of this is as all these wires were melted together um, and the, the, the cap laid on the ground was aluminum. And so the fire was hot enough that it melted that. So you can have alum, aluminum down in your well, um, all the plastic from all these wires or even some of the metal possibly, um, you know, this is a mess, right? Um, but what, the other part of this is for every well uh, that has, you know, one of these type of caps or any uh, like a red monitor cap that has a gasket, most people never replace that gasket. And you know, as well as I do that over time, especially whenever you have seasons, um, there's freezing thaws and all those things, those rubber gaskets get brittle and eventually pieces break off or they crack and now they're not uh, sealed anymore. Um, and it should be a maintenance issue that folks replace those gaskets every so often, but you, it's something you don't really hear of. So um, what that does is anytime, if you have a flooding event and the water overtops your well or gets close, then you should consider that it's probably contaminated and test it before you do anything else. And the other thing I'll mention here is if you're in an area where you, you know, this is in El Paso County, Colorado, um, but where those wires are melted, if you didn't turn the power off before, you, you know, assuming you had to leave your home because there's a fire coming your way, uh, make sure you've turned the power off to your well. Because if you don't, and this happens, um, this could fuse those wires together and your pump could just run and run and run until it burns up. Um, and so there's a lot of things to consider. We actually have some information on our website about those things. So where to get it analyzed? Um, every state accredits labs because again, every community water supply has to test every three months um, for a large list of constituents. And so um, to for a lab to be allowed to analyze community water samples for compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act, they have to be accredited by the state through a federal program, um, NELAC, I think it's called, I don't remember what it stands for, um, it's a, I know the last three letters are a laboratory accreditation program uh, or laboratory accreditation something to see, um, or maybe it is B, regardless. Uh, and so there's a list. Every state, so like in Illinois, it's our Illinois EPA is our compliance agency uh, that works with the community water supplies. So they have a list on their website of all the labs that have got accreditation to do samples in Illinois. Um, labs don't have to be accredited to do private well samples, but we recommend you use one that is because that means they've went to the trouble and they understand the rules and they understand the methods and procedures that are required by law for community water supplies and they're much more likely to provide an accurate result uh, on your water quality. Um, some states have programs from private well sampling, uh, for instance, uh, Missouri, or not Missouri, Iowa has a grants to counties program where their state legislature gives their counties funding to help cost share uh, water sample analysis. And so if you're in Iowa, that's an awesome program that everyone should take advantage of. Um, I think they also help with abandoning wells if you have old wells that aren't being used anymore. Um, so uh, when you contact a lab though, um, they should be able to answer all your questions. They should give you good instructions, explain what you need to do, if you need to keep it in a fridge or use an ice pack. Um, all those things and you ask all the questions you need until you're satisfied and what I tell uh, I actually tell labs as well is that if a well owner calls you and you can't answer their questions I tell the well owner they should go find another lab because every lab should be enough versed in the issues related to private wells that they can help a well owner get uh, what they need done uh, to get a, a, a quality sample to their lab.
Um, and labs these days, they usually they ship them out, they provide you the bottles, everything you need, and the set of instructions. I know even for the research projects we do, a lot of times we ask homeowners to collect the sample, and so we just provide them step-by-step -step instructions on uh, when to collect the sample and what to do the night before, and you know, all that sort of thing should be covered. Um, this is EPA's webpage about certification of labs. Um, and so if you go down this page, there's a list and you can click on a state or you can click on the drop down. And so um, this is the labs. Each one of these goes to a web page for a state. Oh, I guess I didn't include another slide here. I thought I did. My bad. I'm going the wrong direction here. Um, but when you do this, like in Illinois, to go to LNA EPA's webpage, Missouri to go to Missouri DNRs, um, Michigan, Michigan will go to Eagle. Um, that's EAGL, I think is the, I can't remember what that stands for, but it's the agency in Michigan that works with compliance for drinking water systems. And so all that's available, um, at your state primacy agency's webpage, but if you have trouble finding that, you can go this route. And if you just look like, look up state certification programs on Google, um, you'll get right to this page It'll be near the top of the list. Okay, as far as interpreting the results, so you've had a water sample, now you get the results back. I know I've had questions from folks who, you know, had someone email me and they had a six page uh, report. And in the end, they still weren't sure whether their well was okay or not, because it never really uh, directly answered that question. Um, there are places online, and I'm actually gonna show you one, but um, my advice is that you should always take your results to your local health department um, or your state health agency and ask them for a qualified answer. And if uh, a particular local health district or county health department doesn't have the expertise to answer that, they will know who to contact either, you know, like in Illinois, um, we would go to our state department of health. They have toxicologists on staff who, you know, that's part of their mission is to uh, interpret those sampling results and to let you know if there's any issues. And so, um, we would recommend if you find something in your well uh, and it doesn't seem reasonable, and if it's coliform, it's probably likely that you know there's another reason for that. But if not, um, or if it's really an oddball type of answer, it's really high for some reason, then it's always good to uh, resample just to confirm for that constituent. And um, if you sample for total bacteria, total coliform, then you should also go back and do an E. coli test if it was positive. And either way, um, you can boil your water until um, you can get your well disinfected or chlorinated. And uh, hopefully that takes care of the problem. But you should not use the water until after you've disinfected and retest and it's shown that you've actually eliminated the threat. So, and I know, uh, I don't think I answered this question in the questions at the end, but I remember there was a question this month about whether or not I could use water that was positive for coliform um, for making pasta because you're boiling the water. <laughs> and I had never thought about that, but I, I guess you could because you are boiling the water that should kill the bacteria. I just probably wouldn't recommend it. If you know your water's got coliform in it, um, you should try to fix that first. So um, I said I was gonna show you a, a tool that you can use online. So the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services um, with a grant from CDC developed this tool called the Be Well Informed Guide. And um, it's meant for New Hampshire residents, but anyone can use it. Um, it's open to the public. And down at the bottom where it says enter your well water results, if you get a water sample result, um, you can click on that and it takes you to this page. Uh, they ask you in the top right what New Hampshire town or city you're from. You can say anonymous or you can put a town in. Um, I used anonymous because I made this up, but um, they're trying to understand the water quality in New Hampshire a little better. So the folks in New Hampshire that do this, um, I certainly would recommend you do put what town you're from. It's still not giving them any information that's really personal, um, but it helps them understand where there might be water quality problems, water quality problems in their state, um, or where those might be concentrated. Maybe there's only one area that has a certain, uh, maybe it's got high manganese or you know some other thing. So um, I put in 15 micrograms per liter. The other thing that's nice is your lab results may not be in micrograms per liter. They might be in milligrams per liter or parts per million or parts per billion. Um, most labs have that standardized on milligrams per liter, um, but not everyone. 
And so that eliminates the issue of making a mistake. Because um, if you see uh, 0.015 milligrams per liter uh, and put that in, uh, well, I said that backwards. If it's 15 uh, micrograms per liter, but they want you to put it in milligrams per liter, now you've made it you know, a thousand times higher than it is. And so this is the first one of these kind of tools that actually gives you the option of units. And why that's important is, uh, so whenever you sign up for the private well class, you get one lesson a week emailed to you as a PDF over 10 weeks. But the first thing you're sent is a pretest. And it's, I can't remember, it's not very many questions, 11 or 12 questions. And the idea is you take the pretest, you go through the class, then you take a post-test, and we can look at the scores and the differences and say, hey, you, you learned something here, that's great. And it helps us whenever we write proposals to get more funding to maintain our class and keep things going. So we certainly encourage people to take the pretest, but we don't, uh, it's not a requirement. But in that, one of the questions is basically converting units um, and only 25% of the folks who've taken our pretest uh, have got that right. And it, what it, you know, me like everyone else, if you're not using a lot of math after you got out of high school or college, uh, you know, some of that gets fuzzy and the units thing um, can be a problem. You can certainly slip a digit or whatever. And so being able to put this result down in the units that are actually on the piece of paper for your lab result means it's not going to get screwed up is the bottom line and you're going to get the real result here um so if uh if i hit submit after i've done this and i put in arsenic it's going to give me a red x because the standard is 0.1 or 10 micrograms per liter or 0.1 milligram 0.01 milligrams per liter and so since it's over it tells you um here's what you can do there's two types of treatment that'll work absorbed to media or an RO unit, and um, what what does POU mean? POU is uh, point of use, which is like putting that RO unit at your kitchen tap, versus POE, which is point of entry, which means it would when it where it comes into the house. So like your softener is likely a POE unit, right? It it's softening all the water in your home, um, and so but it gives you great information on what kind of treatment you might need. And so um, you don't have to worry about uh, having the wrong thing or something that removes, you know, something that you weren't really worried about. So it's pretty handy. And yeah, there's a whole list of information here. Um, under treatment options, there's really two types of devices and they all have a standard based on the National Sanitation Foundation ANSI standard um, for absorptive media and for RO. And if you do have to get treatment equipment, for example, in this instance, if you have arsenic, make sure that it it, has, it meets those standards. And there's third-party certifiers, NSF, uh, Underwriters Lab, UL, like you used to see on the light bulbs, and uh, the Water Quality Association, Gold Seal. That means that that treatment equipment's been tested and it actually does what it says it's supposed to do. It'll remove uh, that arsenic. Um, so the BWAL Inform Tour was so popular that after New Hampshire developed it, um, the US EPA got involved and now it's, um, yeah, and so now it's available uh, through this buoninform.info workbench um, for these states and probably more today. Um, and so the advantage here is on that last slide, it actually listed some resources strictly for New Hampshire. And though those are probably uh, mostly appropriate for other parts of the country, they may not be exact, and they may not be the exact same information that you know Massachusetts wants to provide or Wyoming wants to provide to their well owners. And so these states in Wake County, North Carolina, have all um, developed uh, through this tool um, specific information to provide to the well owners in their state to go along with that uh, result that you saw. And so it's really it's really pretty handy. There should be all 50 states here and hopefully someday there will be. Uh, so again, I wanna mention uh, when you're interpreting results, even this tool, even though it's nice, you know, groundwater's complicated. Sometimes it can have unique constituents in it that aren't uh, what you typically see. So always take your results to a health professional. Um, you know, their job is to help make sure your water's safe to drink. Um, and this third bullet here, they cannot tell you to stop drinking your water or condemn your well, they can only recommend it. That was true for so many years, but um, today 
there, um, I know there's at least one local health district in Massachusetts and maybe one in Connecticut where if they sample your well and they find something, they can force you to um, remediate it or they can condemn it. And um, if you're worried about that, then the first thing to do is find out what the rules are in your state. Um, excuse me, my phone went off. Um, and just ask them, you know, what legal authority do they have? Because uh, like in Illinois, I can take a sample to any health department, uh, county health department in the state and ask them to review it. They may say, hey, you know, your arsenic's 150 ppb, um, where the standard's 10. So you really should not drink this water. But it's totally up to me as a homeowner to decide whether I'm going to drink it or not. And I use that example because I've done a lot of arsenic research in Illinois, and I've certainly ran across a number of homes where they continue to drink the water, even though the water, uh, the arsenic level is actually 150 ppb or uh, in that vicinity. Um, it's a personal choice. They, you know, their folks live there their whole life. They've lived there their whole life. Whatever the situation might be, they choose to just ignore it. Um, but it's, you know, it's not the smart thing to do, uh, given that. There's a lot of research that shows that over 10 arsenic and some folks say even lower can cause health issues. So um, that's my advice, though, is just ask first and find out, um, you know, and it's totally a personal decision whether you want to take that risk. But um, in 99 percent of the country, no one can tell you you can't drink your water. So, um, yeah. And I need to go back. Here we go. Okay, as far uh, a few other things, well construction. Um, you know, most states have well construction code. I mentioned two, Pennsylvania, Alaska, that still do not, um, which I know they've tried hard. Uh, folks in those states, in both states, have really tried hard to get that changed, but it's a political decision, certainly at least in Pennsylvania. And so, um, but even as those codes have changed over years, like our Illinois well code has changed a number of times because we've learned something new. The science wasn't there whenever it first started in, in 1978 or 1980, um, all those things. Um, but any well that's already in place is grandfathered in. It's not like you can tell someone they have to upgrade their well. Uh, it's too costly, all those things. And so what we still see today are wells that are in pits, especially in northern climates, which, you know, a well was put down in a pit so that it was below the frost line in the winter. And um, there wasn't such a thing as a pitless adapter like we have today. So now our well casings can come up to the surface and stick up. Um, so I run in, I know we did a project inventorying wells in nine townships, almost 400 square miles in a rural area in central Illinois. We found 1,708 wells total. And I believe like 60 of those were still in a pit, um, which you know our recommendation would be not to have your well in a pit. If there's a heavy rainstorm, um, they're likely not uh, watertight, uh, whatever you have for a lid. Um, and so that well is going to get flooded and it happens commonly. And so they're just not you know, extend that up to the surface. Uh, also hand dug wells. I actually grew up on an old hand dug well that was 14 foot deep and it was in the middle of a ravine where every time it rained, water ran right to the well. Um, our well still in use, uh, where I grew up, uh, there's a lot of hand dug wells that are still in use all over the country. And so, um, they're a risk typically because they're not sealed at the surface uh, they're not meant to be protected they're meant to be a way to get shallow water in the well and these days you know surface runoff and those things typically have uh, stuff or can have stuff in them and so um, they provide not only for a chance for surface water to get in your well and cause contamination but they can also be a safety hazard um, as we see here uh, these two pictures well the picture on the left is from the Washington State Department of Ecology. They're the state agency for Washington State that regulates drillers and, and well construction code. And so this plywood that's on top of this well ran all the way across. It's in a little well house. You can see all the gray stuff on the ground around the well by the funnel. That's probably rotting insulation for this little well house. But this woman who lived there, she uh, stepped on that plywood, it broke. She fell in and, and it killed her. And um, the well on the right is, it's really for effect. This is a well that was an old brick-lined well in Southern Illinois. Uh, Don was down there looking up his ancestry in this rural area, and we happened to stay at the same place. And he was showing me these pictures. 
Um, and that's a piece of concrete tile sticking up that they, they basically shoved in like a straw to, to um, for the top of the well. It only goes down four feet. Uh, the well sticks up about six inches and there's no cap on it. And so um, that's a goat. There's a farm with goats that's less than a quarter mile away. Uh, one day one of the goats got out and um, ended up in this well and you can see what happened to it and that well water. And you know, you'd think people would notice, and this well is wasn't in use at the time, thank goodness. But I more times, I mean, um, I bet I've 10 instances of people calling me saying, hey, um, you know, what do I do about this? And either the well tastes funny, water starts tasting funny or smells funny. I know um, on one of these webinars, it was probably nine months ago or so, somebody said they went out to their dad's house, he's got an old dug well, and uh, the water smelled really funny. So they went out and they opened the old well up and there's like 40 snakes in the well. And the gentleman was still drinking his water. And so these things, people aren't aware. They, it's underground, out of sight, out of mind. Um, they all need to be corrected. And that's why, um, you know, knowing what well construction code is in your state today is important for understanding um, where your deficiencies might be. Or if you have one of these older wells and you realize that it isn't uh, up to snuff, so to speak, um, one thing you can do is have someone from RCAP come out and do an assessment and they can give you advice on what your options might be or things you can do to make it better. Um, because this is really not safe. Uh, yeah. So bring them up to code, you know, fill in with clay grout if you need to, install a pitless if it's an older well that doesn't have one. And then, you know, also talk to uh, your state well authority or someone locally or a contractor and see what they suggest for options. You know, get advice more from more than one person. And, um, you know, uh, it's gonna cost some, you know, some money probably, but again, um, it's about protecting your health. And, uh, you know, that's certainly more important. Same thing for abandoned wells. So these are wells that are unused and not sealed. So um, most states require that if you have an old unused well, that you properly abandon it by sealing it, uh, typically filling it up with a clay or cement um, grout, at least for part of it, so that you know water can't get down through the annulus or through the well hole, uh, the well casing, and contaminate an aquifer. So um, because well logs weren't required until between the 60s and 80s in most states, um, there's a lot more wells out there than we have on file. Um, Illinois is probably one of the better states as far as the amount of uh, well logs that we do have on file. And that study I mentioned where we found 1,708 wells, only 788 of those we had logs for. And you know it was a rural area, a lot of older homes, probably should be expected to be less than 50%. Um, but it, um, some states, you know, in New York, they didn't require well logs until 2000. And uh, they only have about 10%, they estimate about 10% of the wells um, do they actually have a log for. Uh, because of that, because all the other wells before that, there's no log put on file, or rarely. So um, like wells uh, that are in pits or old dug wells, um, these undocumented wells need to be sealed and filled in. You know, even now with rural water districts, some people are um, early on in the game, like in the 80s, folks had the option of keeping their well if they want to use it for like livestock or um, irrigating their garden. Nowadays, um, most of these rural water districts do not allow you to keep your well. You have to sign an agreement that you're going to abandon it because people, one, they cheat. They'll find a way to hook that back up to save them money. That can cause cross-contamination problems. But two, those wells end up going unused and being left to deteriorate and eventually become a safety hazard or a source of contamination. So if you have one of these old wells in your property, you need to seal it and properly abandon it. Uh, following whatever the rules are in your state. Um, if not, you know, uh, someone could be trespassing on your property, fall through it, it could kill them or hurt them, um, and you'll be liable. And or, uh, you know, there's folks who think those make a great place to throw old containers and uh, drums and all that stuff. Uh, you contaminate an aquifer, it might, it might ruin water for much more than just your own well and you could be liable for that. Um, and those, yeah, it would ruin you, uh, honestly. Uh, aquifer cleanup is an expensive business. So uh, here's some more examples. 
the two pictures are both from the Washington State Department of Ecology. They have a blog. Uh, top one, they're pulling a horse out of an old abandoned well that was in a pasture. Um, the bottom one, this guy was walking in his backyard in Sheldon, Washington, and uh, no idea there was an old well there and fell in um, 45 feet and walked away. Uh, very, very lucky. I don't know all the circumstances. I'd read it years ago, but um, I don't remember all the circumstances, but he managed to just walk away uh, until they pulled him up. So uh, very fortunate gentleman. And the three, the four newspaper clippings, these are all from the 90s. Um, the third one's the one that's the most popular. Uh, Jessica McClure was a 18-month-old, um, I think. Yeah, that's what it says there. Uh, in Texas, this was covered live on CNN. It took them like a day and a half to get her out. Um, she sung during the thing. I, I was, I remember it like, yeah, she's a mother of three today. Um, you know, she survived, but not everybody's so lucky. Um, the bottom one is the Champaign County. That's where our, uh, the capital of our state and Springfield, Illinois is. Um, yeah, it's just things happen. And so if you have one of these wells uh, that's not properly sealed and is a risk, you should fill it in. Okay, so a little bit about the private well class. Um, again, I mentioned it's 10 lessons and it's sent to you via email. So you sign up uh, with just your email address, your first name and what state you live in. And that's really so that we can show our the people that fund us, the US EPA and RCAP, that um, we are reaching people in the, whole in the whole country, which we have, we've had almost 11 or almost 12,000 people take our class, which is awesome. Um, but there's 23 million private wells serving 58 million Americans. And so uh, we got a long way to go, is the way I look at that. Um, we also provide these webinars, right, every month. And some of them are specific. We do one for EHPs. We do one in July on uh, septic systems. And, um, but the really the meat of that, I think, is the fact that we offer uh, a chance for you to ask questions and we try to answer the ones we can. Um, if they haven't been answered three or four times before, um, we try to answer those. And so um, the website's just privatewellclass.org, and this is the front page. You just click on take our free class, and it takes you to a page. Uh, it'll take you to a page where you can sign up. There's a resource library, which part of that are for each of the 10 lessons. So the first lesson is called the science of groundwater. So the idea here is you learn how water moves through the ground, how it gets in your well, how your well can be contaminated, and it's a step-by-step -step process. You know, lesson seven's about how to find local information. Lesson 10's about treatment. Um, but we also provide these other resources for each one of those. And these are all publicly available and free. Um, you can click on a link and it'll take you to um, that document and you can read it at your leisure. And say that's one of the things that people tell us in the evaluation at the end that they've done the most is, is download some of this additional information. And so there is a lot available for you. Um, I'm gonna talk later about disinfecting a well. And so it's lesson 10 here about water treatment that has that document. So when I bring it up, you'll know what this looks like. Um, and so uh, we also do webinars on a lot of different things. Outreach strategies is really for professionals, not for well owners. It's about how to do outreach to well owners. You know, they're unique in that uh, they represent almost every demographic. A well owner can be rich, poor, educated, uneducated, urban, rural, you name it. Uh, they, they basically fit into every social, economic, and education class. Uh, the, whenever I talk about this, um, one of the examples I show is um, where I grew up, which I grew up on a small farm in a very rural county in Illinois. Um, you know, there's two wells in our section, a square mile. And I show a, a picture with those two wells. And then I show uh, Cook County, Illinois, which if you're not familiar with Illinois, that's Chicago in the Chicago metropolitan area. It's actually the county closest to the lake. And so it's, it's urban. All the counties that surround Cook County are also urban. Yet there are 3,000 private wells in Cook County, which most people uh, who know where that's at would say, no way could you have all those private wells there. But there are. And the problems they have are in, in Cook County are much different than the ones I had growing up. And so, you know, you have to treat them separately. And so outreach is really a tricky thing. You have to understand your audience before you even start. And we have a whole webinar and actually a, a longer class 
uh, for environmental health professionals just on those topics. Um, we do want to mention every July on septic systems. And again, these are all available both uh, under our webinar and events tab or on our YouTube channel. And you can see them full screen there. Um, and you know, when lead was a big issue after Flint happened and all that, we did two webinars on lead and uh, one in 2016 and one in 2018. And we brought in an expert from Virginia Tech who was, you know, they're the folks that um, actually found all the lead in Flint, Michigan in the first place. But one of uh, those folks, she's now at Northeastern University, uh, Dr. Kelsey Piper, we invited her to present on this webinar about all the work she did in Virginia and North Carolina with private wells and the things that she found and all the things you need to be aware of because lead isn't a community water supply problem, it's a uh, home problem, right? Um, all the effort right now in the country through the infrastructure bill and all those things is to replace lead service lines. You hear that term all the time. And the idea is to have all the lead service lines in the country removed in you know eight or 10 years. That's the line from a water main to your meter. Every, if you're on a public water supply and you live in town, everything from the meter on into your home belongs to the homeowner. So if you have lead pipes in your house, replacing the lead service line going out to the main doesn't remove your problem. It re might reduce it a little, um, but you still have lead plumbing in your home or lead solder in your copper pipes in your home. And so lead's a huge issue for private wells and private well owners. Uh, because of that, because a lot of homes in the rural areas are older. Uh, a lot of them have lead pipes or galvanized pipe and those things. We created another page to go along with that to provide resources. So it's just privatewellclass.org slash lead. And you can get to this page where it talks about filters that actually remove lead really well. Uh, some of the things, basic information about, you know, the health risks and stuff from trusted sources like US EPA and CDC. And so um, all that's there if you're interested. And then we have a series of these short training videos are all four to six minutes long about uh, special topics or in, uh, single topics, I should say, not special. Uh, what is a bedrock well? Um, and what is a bedrock aquifer? You know, what are to do after a flood? What should I know about a shared well? This one uh, is a lot more to sharing a well than a lot of people realize and a lot of times People who live next to each other and share a well end up not being so neighborly when something goes wrong and you have to come up with two or $3,000 to fix it. And so understanding those things in advance is important. Um, we have one of them is, I think that's the next slide. Yeah, how does, listen to why does my well keep losing pressure? We have one called, how does my pressure tank work? And it's had over 400,000 views since 2016. Um, and that tells us a lot of people in private wells have pressure problems. You need to understand that you have a, a pressure switch and you can set that. So if it's set at you know, um, 30 and 60 or 30 and 50, you might wanna bump it up to 40 and 60. Um, if you have an older style, you know, full size tank, um, there's just a lot to know as a well owner. And especially if you wanna, uh, you know, you wanna have good water pressure on the second floor, for instance. Um, we started a podcast a few years ago. We've had uh, three seasons, there's 36 episodes. We bring in folks like Dr. Alan Wolf, who, is the head of pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital. He works with um, all the really crazy, special, uh, hard to figure out cases. And m more often than not, those end up being private well issues, um, which is sad, but he's uh, seen it all. He also uh, was a lead for the American Academy of Pediatrics. They have a technical report and a policy statement about private wells, and he was um, kind of led that whole effort. So great guy. Um, Margaret Martins is with the Water Systems Council. Um, you know, they have programs, they have a lot of materials for well owners. I'm going to show one here in, during the questions part. Um, and they also uh, have a program that's uh, separately funded to uh, help fund low income folks to replace their wells. And so we talked to her about those things. Um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Uh, the podcast also does have uh, some of the guests are related to community water issues. The idea behind the podcast is to look at all the things more kind of a rural area. It's called a 
uh, Drinking Water in Rural America podcast. Um, our class is available in Spanish. If you are um, someone who's a water professional or health professional and in your jurisdiction you have um, native Spanish speakers on private wells, uh, they can take our class here. Um, yeah, it's, everything's there for the class as far as um, all the text been converted and all the figures have been converted into Spanish. We actually have some of the videos, but not all of them. Um, we were very fortunate to have a young man, a PhD student from Columbia here uh, working in, uh, in civil engineering on a Fulbright scholarship and, and he basically rewrote our class for us. In the end, this is our goal, pretty simple for, for our program. We wanna help well owners. Uh, they need to understand why their well is important, why they need to understand how it works, um, and then how they can protect themselves from risk. So that if you're a well owner, we hope that running through the class, uh, it's again, it's self-paced, and participating in these webinars when you have questions, um, asking. And so um, we can help you become more informed and help you understand. Uh, you know, it seems daunting to some folks early on, but I think, you know, um, once you learn more about your specific situation, the geology where you live and the type of well you have, um, it all makes sense and it's important to you so you won't forget it. So um, I mentioned the submitted questions. Again, if you have a question that we don't get to today or you've already got questions based on some of the things that I've mentioned today, um, please put them in the question box or the chat box. Um, I have both, I don't know that everyone does. And so um, Katie's taking those and putting them in basically a Google document that we share, and I'll pull that up on screen um, at the end um, after we get through these slides. I'd also wanna mention that we do the same thing for every webinar. So, and every month we get different questions. Um, not all of them are different. You know, we get questions about disinfection every month. And so I usually cover it every month because we have a lot of new folks, um, especially for a webinar like this one, that are uh, well owners who finally, who just discovered the private well class and they may be here for the first time. And so we cover some of those things, but I wanna mention it because if you go to our YouTube channel and look at all our past webinars, you can find like the last one of these, I think was done in May. Um, if you go back to the May webinar on common questions and go to this point, you know, an hour and 15 minutes in where the questions start, those questions will not be the same as the questions we're answering today. So there's a whole set of questions every month that are different in a lot of cases that will help you learn a lot more about your well. And they're all questions that were asked by other well owners uh, in general. And so there are things that you may be thinking yourself too. So um, it's worth it, my opinion. Okay, so testing. Uh, what is a reliable testing kit for me to use myself? Well, so we don't really recommend using home test kits. Um, we tried some um, a long time ago, um, and there are things that are exceptions. Like, you know, uh, a pool shop has a pretty good home kit for testing pH and maybe a few other things. Um, but in most cases, they're qualitative at best. They won't give you an accurate quantitative answer. And in some cases, they're completely unreliable. I tested a bunch for arsenic that were color metric. Uh, you know, it depends on whether you're in yellow light or white light, and there's all these things, a lot of false positives. Um, you need to decide that you and your family's health are worth the cost to have your well testing done by an accredited lab. Um, you know, it's gonna cost 150 to $200, and I realize that's a lot of money, um, but it's also, you know, it's worth it. Uh, find a way uh, to have that done, because it's, uh, you know, to know your water's safe is a great thing, and people, you know, Literally hundreds of well owners have said to me, and I, I'm not exaggerating, oh, we don't drink the water, we use bottled water. Well, I guarantee you, you've spent in a year 10 times what it would cost to do a water test to find out if your water is safe or not. And, you know, we talk about the problem cases and that the things you need to be aware of and bring up things like beryllium that's a problem in Rhode Island. Much, I don't know the right word to use here, many much, most, I wouldn't say most, uh, maybe most. Uh, private wells are actually perfectly fine. Um, you know, it, until 10 or 15 years ago, a lot of even community, small community or subdivision type water supplies that were regulated didn't have to chlorinate. 
because they didn't feel there was a risk to that. And that's the same for a private well. You know, um, no one chlorinates their private well like a, using continuous treatment or only unless they've had a problem. Nine, you know, over 99% of wells aren't disinfected in any way and your water's fine. Um, you know, some, a lot of uh, chemical problems like arsenic um, only occur in certain aquifers. Um, if you test your water, you know it's got nothing in it. Uh, you're gonna save yourself a lot of money in bottled water. That's, I guess that's my point. But you can't really use those home test kits. They just, uh, they're not accurate. Um, yeah, I don't think you'll find any that have been certified as accurate through one of the testing agencies like Underwriters Lab. And uh, if that's not true, somebody would please let me know. Um, free water, can I have my well water tested for free? And if so, where? So I really don't know of any free programs that are just there. Um, I, you know, I was always proud to be able to tell people that the water survey offered free water testing for inorganics and metals to any homeowner or well owner in Illinois. And that was true until 2008. And uh, we went from being an agency under DNR to inside the University of Illinois, and um, that all changed. And that's really unfortunate. Um, there is an event that the National Groundwater puts on. It's, it's become pretty popular. It's called Groundwater Awareness Week. It's always the second week of March. Um, literally six to 800 different organizations participate. And you know that could be as simple as uh, putting out banners and reminding people they need to test or, you know, in Illinois, the Tazewell County Health Department, I don't know if they're still doing it, but they used to offer free water testing just that week. So if you, um, cont you know, find out if anything is going on related to Groundwater Awareness Week in your area or when it gets close to the second week of March, start, you know, watching the news and the paper and go on your uh, local health district's website, see if there's anything like that going on. Because in states where they don't or in jurisdictions where they don't offer free testing, uh, they may be that weak. So that's all I can uh, say. Uh, New Mexico has a program for homeowners with septic systems. They will give you a free water test if you provide them with all the information about your on-site wastewater system. And that's because um, a lot of those are not known where they're at and they're a contamination source. And so having an inventory of at least where they are is a huge deal nationwide. And so New Mexico has come up with a program to make to give you some incentive. If you're in New Mexico, it's certainly worth it. Um, you know, in most cases, they can figure out you likely have a septic system just because of where you are. And they know where the centralized wastewater systems are, you know, with uh, sewer lines and stuff. And so it's a great way to get a free water test. And I already mentioned Iowa, the Grants to Counties program. Um, so if you're in Iowa, contact your county health department and ask them um, what they offer. And it's probably a cost share. Um, I'm sure some counties may be able to make that free, um, but it's still, you know, you cut the cost in half. Uh, that's awesome. So, and lastly, I'll mention that we do a webinar, um, not every year, but fairly frequently on funding and financing. And we, last time we did it was in February of 2023. And part of that is for the USDA program nationwide. Um, and depending on your income, there's uh, USDA programs that can help with uh, not only uh, a new well or fixing a well, but treatment or even your septic. Um, but we also went out and just looked for programs around the country that might be local or might have, you know, something like the ones I mentioned before. And so we put a webinar together that shows where some of those are. And again, it comes down to you need to find out what's going on in your area. Like um, in Illinois, some of the soil water conservation districts will cost share abandoning in a well. Um, and I guess that's not water testing, but the idea is, um, you know, you need to ask and look around. Um, and the other thing is that though there's no set programs, if there's a like a spill or a plume of contaminant that's known, uh, I know like in Florida, the State Department of Health will come in and sample all the private wells in an area where there's where that's happened. In some cases, though, then they may, um, and in those cases, uh, they've went in and tried to run water lines because the aquifer's contaminated and, uh, you know, you're not gonna be able to put a well in uh, anywhere and, and get good water. So, um, and so it might be free when the state gets involved, but you certainly don't wanna be in a situation where they're examining whether or not there's contaminants in your water supply unfortunately. Um, I'm concerned about my neighbor's septic, which is less than 50 feet from my well. 
being uh, being faulty. Uh, what should I be checking for in my well and how often? So obviously we already mentioned coliform and nitrate should tell you if the septic is affecting your well um, or E. coli, right? Um, fecal bacteria. And so uh, but really your well construction and water source are also important to know. Um, you can have, you know, I, I say this to people that are worried about pesticides because their well's right next to a farm field. You know, it really depends on how your well was constructed and where your water in, is coming from in your well. So where I live in, in Champaign County, Illinois, our aquifer is a sand and gravel aquifer at about 160 feet. If my well were properly constructed and grouted so that water couldn't go in at the surface from around the outside of the casing, um, then I would consider there's no way a pesticide is going to get into my well because water's coming from the screen, which is the bottom five feet of the well. So the only place water can get in my well uh, in a sand and gravel aquifer that's screened is where the screen is, and that's always at the bottom. And so um, if that were the case for your well, then um, your neighbor's septic isn't gonna affect your well. But on the other hand, if you have an old hand dug well that's 14 foot deep and all the water's coming from the shallow water table, um, you know, the water table, it's think about the water in a bathtub, it's flat, right? It's because of equal pressure everywhere. It wants to be flat, it wants to be level. If I pull the plug on one end and that water starts sucking out, it all runs towards that drain because again, it's still trying to be level and at constant pressure. Well, that's the same thing. Every time you turn on your pump in your well, you're lowering the water level in your well. So all the surrounding water that's in the water table is gonna run to the well to try to fill it back up again. And so um, it certainly would be a big risk if it's, uh, if it's that way. So, you know, it, does it meet code? Does it have casing and grout or is it a hand dug well, like I mentioned? Um, do you know how deep it is? I mean, you're, I'm talking about your well. Uh, where the screen is, if it has one, how long, how much casing there is. You know, as I mentioned, a bedrock well could be 600 feet deep, but only have 50 feet of casing. And that means all the water can get anywhere from 50 feet on down. And so it, all that matters, um, you know, where your water's coming from. And so uh, those are the questions you need to ask to really understand if it's a risk, because um, it very well may not be. If your well is a newer well, it's properly constructed, it's been grouted around the outside, and uh, the aquifer you're pulling from is pretty deep and there's a lot of casing. Okay. Uh, PFAS. Why test for PFAS chemicals in ground slash well water? So um, PFAS is, you know, that's, that's the new, you know, every so many years something comes up and we have this big issue uh, with groundwater or wells or drinking water, and currently it's PFAS. Um, but it's this is a big one, honestly, uh, because PFAS is used in everything. There are thousands of PFAS chemicals, literally, and now that they're looking for it, it's in everything. It's in our bodies. It's in our clothes, our soil, the the Teflon pan you cook with, right? Uh, firefighting foam. It's uh, there are scientists who are just collecting um, air filters, like for uh, a furnace or a air conditioning unit and it's showing up on the filter, so it's just in the air. I mean, it's everywhere, right? Um, there's no chance that you're uh, my age and you don't have PFAS in your body. It's just the way it is. What that does to us, you know, that's one of the big unknowns. Um, but in rural areas, what, we, what I've learned working with folks who do research on PFAS is that many times it's linked to your septic system because so many things um, have PFAS in them. We're ingesting it we're uh, excreting it, all those things. Um, that's where the source uh, has happened. You know, it's what it's whenever there's so many samples of well for PFAS, that's what it gets linked back to eventually. So there's just a lot of things we don't know. We don't know all the health effects. You know, they're talking about putting out rules for community water supplies for like I'm between six and 10 PFAS chemicals, even though there's thousands. So we don't even understand how they break down, um, if the breakdown products are, are more risky. You know, back in the 90s, I worked a lot on pesticides and, you know, like atrazine was a problem, but some of the breakdown products from atrazine as it started to break down the environment were much more carcinogenic and a problem. And so none of that stuff is really, they're all working on it. All the, you know, there's a ton of research going into that and they don't even act the same. Uh, they all have the same 
uh, I can't remember, it's a carbon fluor uh, fluoride bond, maybe, no, that's not it. Uh, I don't remember what it is, um, I apologize. But anyway, um, they all have this one bond that's what makes them a PFAS chemical, but they cause different kinds of complications, health complications, and they don't act the same way. So um, that's what's going on. And uh, because it's everywhere and we still don't understand all the health effects, we do understand some, and that's why it's a concern. Um, but the good news is that you can treat for it. So activated carbon or ion exchange um, or RO. And there's a, EPA has this thing called a treatability database. And um, yeah, and Science Matters, this first URL that I listed there is, um, Science Matters is a, like a publication they put out. It's an email, like a newsletter uh, that has that information in it and their treatability database. Uh, you could just, you pick a contaminant, it'll tell you how to treat it if, if there's information on that. So um, again, you can Google those things or you can email us and we can get you the, the these links that kind of long to try to type in now. Coliform versus E. coli. My well tested negative for E. coli, but positive for coliform. The lab said it was likely two um, and with no units. And uh, I'm assuming that's CFUs, colony forming units. Uh, that's the typical term, I believe. And I think that really just means that um, when they put it in a, like a Petri dish or some kind of medium to grow, that's how many colonies formed. And so that's a measure if there's a lot of uh, coliform, you have a bunch of colonies. If there's very little, you're gonna have a few. Um, I will say that many states require only that you provide a presence or not present, present or not present result to a, uh, someone who gets a sample done. Um, I was a firm believer that that's all you really needed to know for many years. Um, but because of questions like this one, um, I've changed my mind. I really believe that having it quantified is important because uh, I would just test again in this case. Two is a very low number. And um, what that suggests to me is it, it's possible that someone didn't handle the sample correctly or um, got their hand in the way when they were collecting the sample. Uh, there's a lot of places for um, you know some of that to get in there. And so um, when we see a very low number like this, then typically, because you know we see these numbers in the hundreds uh, for some homes, where the you know it's it's 150 CFU. That's someone who has a bacteria problem in their well or their home. Could be in your pipes in your home too. Um, but all that said, um, I would sample again because you want to be sure. Um, it, who knows? It could have been some situation where there's actually more in your system than what that particular sample provided. Um, and then if you, and, and, you know, there are, there is information out there about how to collect a sample to be safe um, and make sure you don't contaminate it, some of those things. Um, but if it, that comes back positive, then I would shock it again. Um, and I'll talk more about shock chlorination in a minute, because, you know, if there's, uh, the problem with private wells is that because there isn't continuous chlorination or disinfection, like on a community water supply, the older the well in the home, the more likely there's been um, buildup, uh, biofilm buildup somewhere in the pipes in your home. And so that's where some of those things are going to live. And it's nearly impossible to get rid of them um, once that happens. And so, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, high nitrates in our aquifer. There are several questions about nitrates. So I just use this one. But I want to mention two things. One, um, if it's in the aquifer, um, uh, so that's the bottom part here. If it's in the aquifer, then your options are really to treat the water um, to remove the nitrate or to drill a new well into a different aquifer. Because once it's in the aquifer, there's not a lot you can do about it. All the water that's coming into your well is coming from the aquifer. If it's, um, it's too late. That's like, you know, we tell people not to let things happen, like leave an abandoned well and throw things in it that are gonna contaminate the aquifer because it's so much easier to make sure that um, you eliminate the threat before it can get into the aquifer than it is to remove it from the groundwater system. It can take years and millions of dollars to remove contaminants that are in 
a, a plume of contaminant moving through an aquifer. Uh, it's just, it's a problem. And so really that's the only options you have if the nitrates are too high. But I wanna be clear, um, and I know there's a lot of debate about this. Uh, there's research that suggests there are other issues, but none of it's really been so conclusive that anyone's looked at trying to change the rule. EPA's maximum contaminant level for nitrate is really there to protect against blue baby syndrome. So that 10 milligrams per liter is for uh, pregnant women and babies under six to nine months old. And it's because the nitrate replaces the oxygen in their blood um, and causes, I can't remember the name of the disease, blue baby syndrome is the simple way to say it, but it basically causes uh, your body not to be able to deliver oxygen. And so babies will turn blue and they're suffocating um, because there's, uh, there's nitrate, or it's not nitrate, but it, there's uh, the oxygen's being replaced, uh, it's traveling through your blood. Um, but once you're old enough to break, uh, and it's because the nitrate breaks down to nitrite, but doesn't get broken down further uh, in a baby's stomach until they're old enough that uh, it will completely break it down. So like for us as adults, um, that's not an issue. Um, it doesn't get to our blood. And so um, Minnesota, in, and I'll mention Minnesota here in this example, uh, there's emerging evidence of other risks, but no consensus. And that's from their website. But if you're interested in research related to anything in groundwater or wells, um, Minnesota is probably one of the leading health departments in the country uh, for that type of work. They um, have a lot of resources, and so they've been able to use those wisely. Um, they've done virus research and other things. Um, they have a lot of wherewithal and a lot of know-how. Um, and so uh, their websites are uh, their website is usually full of good information. Um, on about any topic related uh, that we're going to discuss today. Okay, so another nitrate question. There's six homes in the subdivision. And I'm paraphrasing this because it, the question was longer than the slide, um, but uh, it's on 30 acres. So they're five acre tracks. Each has a septic. They're kind of above gradient of where the well is. And there's one well that serves a cistern that then all six homes share. So if you're not familiar with the cistern, uh, in the uh, old days, a cistern was a basically a tank in the ground that collected rainwater off your roof, and that gave you water. Um, and that's that's the very simplest explanation, but it's basically a large tank. So you're pumping into this large tank, and then all six homes are pulling out of it. Well, the nitrate is at 9.75 milligrams per liter, which the you know 10 is the, the limit, and their well's down gradient. So they're worried about you know what can they do. Well, if it's uh, indeed the septic system's causing this, then um, there's probably not a lot to do, and none of the options are great. One would be to um, ask all six homeowners to put in advance on-site treatment for their wastewater to remove the nitrate before it can go out into the environment. Um, the other would be to treat the water coming from the well for nitrate as it's being pumped into the cistern. Um, or thirdly, if it's possible, move the well to an above gradient location. Typically, the water table follows the land surface. So if you um, are in a subdivision that, you know, at the very bottom of the subdivision on the low end, there's a lake and all the homes are up above it. The home that's furthest, uh, highest elevation away, all the water is going to run down towards the lake, even underground uh, in the shallow uh, geology. So that's the best place to be for the well. Everybody else that has a well further down gradient is likely to have concerns if it's shallow that septic from one of the other well or other homes is going to cause problems. So um, that's really the options. And the only other thing I'd mention is that um, if this is an older cistern or it's a concrete cistern, um, if there's any chance that it's cracked, then it may just be that it's water table uh, near surface water that uh, the septic from all the septic systems that's making its way down gradient um, is getting in that way. And so I would be sure that the uh, cistern is actually intact and not, uh, and it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have any cracks in it. So, cause that's, that's the only other option I can think of. Okay, um, sediment. Sometimes we get sediment in, um, supposed to be our, in our toilet tanks, sorry, and bathtubs. Is there something we can do about this? So, um, if it's just, you know, there's all kinds of sediment. There could be sand, 
Uh, if you're if you have a well that's in a sand and gravel aquifer and the screen is breached somehow, you can start pumping a little sand. Um, there's you know if it's a bedrock aquifer, it could be sandstone. Uh, might be one of the geologic units that the well goes through and it's pulling a little bit of material, um, or it could be you know from oxidized iron or manganese. Um, but the best thing to do if it's actually sediment is to put in a five micron sediment filter and see if that removes it. If the particles are smaller than that, you might have to go to a more uh, uh, smaller one. Um, that gets a little more pricey. Uh, and I would think if the sediment's settling in your tank, it would be stopped by a five micron filter. Because um, the thing is, if it's getting in your tub and toilet, it's also gonna be in your softener, it's gonna be in your water heater, and you know that stuff isn't gonna do anything but cause problems down the road. Um, so uh and i'm assuming it's coming from your well i can't think of where else it might be um yeah so if it but if it is if it's black or dark if it's rusty dark red colored whatever then it's, that's likely manganese and um iron and it's probably coming up from the ground in solution as uh and not a solid and it's when it hits air that it oxidizes and forms iron oxide which is why you have the stains on your tanks um all that stuff um yeah and if it's enough that it's causing that kind of particulate then you need a filter meant to remove it and a lot of times that basically involves aeration first to give it a little air so that all that can be um, converted to a solid and then your filter will take it out um, and if it removes iron it removes manganese and actually even some of the iron, uh, arsenic if there is any uh, in those cases um yeah, that's, I think that's really it. Yellow water. So why is my well water yellow and is it safe to drink? Well, it's likely tannins, which is basically, uh, they're formed from organic matter, which is anytime there's a buried soil, uh, those sorts of things, it can uh, cause these organic zones uh, in, in, in the geology. And um, as water moves through those, um, and they have old vegetation in them. You know, we've we've drilled wells where we pulled up pieces of wood uh, from a buried sand and gravel aquifer that basically, when a glacier came, it just covered it all up. And uh, yeah, um, but if it is tannins, they're not harmful. Um, you know, they can, if it's significant enough, it can also have a taste or an odor to it. It's an earthy smell most of the time, um, or it could be linked to some iron. Um, I'd get your water tested then you know for sure. But uh, the one question is, if this isn't a constant thing, if it only happens like after a storm or after a large rain event, then I say that's a bigger issue because that means that somehow water is being pushed into your well from a surface water event, which means your well is not properly protected from the surface. So uh, the Water Systems Council has this nice little brochure on tannins, um, but I suggest, you know, that's likely what it is. Um, but if it's iron or manganese, you know, manganese, uh, well, iron is probably more likely if it's yellow. Um, but if it's if it's not a constant thing, then you need to consider that maybe your well is in, is getting near surface water too. So um, it's it's always a concern. Um, I put these all here because and said class questions because these are all things that you would learn if you take the private well class. Um, what to look for when drilling a new well. There's a whole section on questions to ask a driller, things that you, you know, one of the things I tell people, for instance, is um, you should always put in the contract when you're gonna drill a well that you get a copy of the well log because so many times that doesn't happen. And then you go back to your state agency or a local jurisdiction that's supposed to have a well log and they don't have it. Or you're in a state where, um, you know, the there isn't a lot of enforcement of some of those rules. And, uh, you know, I actually had one um, well owner call me and told me who drilled their well and they refused to give them the log, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, but, you know, the driller is looking at it from, this is my livelihood, the information I gather from every well I drill helps me in the future. And if my competitors have that same information, then they can go into that same area where I'm, you know, the dominant driller, if you will, uh, all that sort of stuff. So. Um, I'm not going to read all these, but um, and I, the bottom one, any books you recommend on these issues, 
Um, I would say the uh, resources, like I showed earlier with lesson one and two, there's a set of those six to 10 different uh, documents that uh, for each of the lessons, that's where I'd start. And those are, you can, you don't have to even sign up for the class to see those. You know, everything on our website is publicly available. Um, shock chlorination, how do I clean, sanitize my well? Um, so a few things about shock chlorination, uh, you should only do it when you need it. And that's determined by sampling that shows that you actually have bacteria. And then if you do, make sure that you're following the right procedure. So um, we recommend using this Minnesota Department of Health guide, the well uh, and water system disinfection. We looked at probably 70 or 80 different documents on how to disinfect the well. And this one's probably, well, in my opinion anyway, this one is the most useful and has the most detail and explains things uh, really well. We link to this under um, our lesson 10 of those resources. It's called, and the lesson 10 is water treatment solutions. And so, you know, there's a list of six or 10 documents there. And one of them is this particular one. And uh, we recommend you get it from there because I know they've changed this document and made a shorter version now that's on their webpage. And this one I think is, is a much better uh, useful document for a homeowner. Uh, it explains how to mix it. You know, pouring straight bleach into a well is a bad idea. Uh, it's too concentrated. Um, it's an oxidant. Um, if you have metal casing or a metal drop pipe or a metal pump, it's going to leach metals off of that if you pour it in too, uh, too concentrated. So it goes through all that, what to do with your treatment devices and what to remove and not remove, uh, all that stuff. So um, that's what I recommend if you're going to disinfect the well. Um, so next question is related. I, if a customer has tried multiple times to sanitize and clean the well and their samples still come back positive for coliform, is there any advice I can give them? Well, really the first question to ask is how did they disinfect the well? Um, Many cases I can uh, tell you of people have said, well, you know, they came out and said just to pour a cup of bleach down the well. Um, or um, in one case, someone here in Champaign County, uh, the homeowner hired them and they admitted they'd not done it before and didn't have a standard procedure, uh, which wouldn't give me much confidence, uh, honestly. So make sure that they follow the right procedure, because if you don't do everything that you need to do there, mix it in the well first at the right concentration, run it through every pipe in your home uh, until you smell chlorine, let it sit overnight so that it has a chance to actually kill the bacteria. Um, you know, it may be that they just didn't do the right thing. Um, it's, it, that, that's a common problem, uh, if you will. Um, there's other things that it could be though. If you followed all the right uh, directions and you uh, feel like you did a good job disinfecting the well, um, it could just be that there's enough things in the water that are reacting with the chlorine that the standard dose, which is around, I think, 200 milligrams per liter, um, isn't enough. And the way they would know that is if um, when you're trying to run it to every toilet, shower, sink in your home, you know, you leave that open and run until you smell chlorine, then you shut it off. And if it, you don't get that smell at the tap, then you don't have enough chlorine in your system to get there. Some other things, uh, it's complicated. So, um, and so sometimes it just doesn't work and that's just the way it is. Um, if bacteria have been there a while, it could be that there are biofilms in your pipes and those form in layers. And so when you chlorinate, it will kill the upper layer, but it might not reach all the way down to the edge of the pipe. And so my first suggestion is to try two or three different times if that happens, um, because you may be killing the layer each time, and but you're not getting to all of it. Uh, the other uh, issue it could be is that your water, your well is tapping a continuous source. You know, we see sometimes, with, especially a shallow dug well, um, where the entire, all the water coming into that well is from about a three inch thick lens of sand that runs through the property. And so if on the other side of the house, even 200 uh, feet away, your septic lines tap into that same sand lens, then it's running right to your well every time you turn on your pump. And so if you have a continuous source like that, if it's septic or feedlot, and it's a shallow well, um, then really the only um, solution is continuous disinfection. And I say continuous disinfection because it doesn't have to be continuous chlorine. It could also be ultraviolet light. Um, you see more and more UV systems now in private homes 
uh, with wells because it, you know there's it has its own issues, but it kills everything. It kills you know bacteria and viruses and, and renders them inert, if you will. Um, or if that's the case, you don't want to use a continuous disinfection. You could put in a new well. And if it's an old hand dug well, then that might be the best solution. If it doesn't, it's always going to be a problem. Um, the last thing it could be is um, chlorine chemistry is complicated and it only works within a certain range of pH. Um, we don't have a lot of good information on this yet, other than to know that if the pH of the water is over eight, then uh, chlorine isn't going to be very effective as a disinfectant. It just um, it doesn't work within that pH range. It changes to a different form uh, of a chlorine compound that's not a disinfectant. And so uh, the options there are to, um, we see that some states recommend adding vinegar to your well, and that's to lower the pH of the water. Um, but that's a tricky thing because as you start mixing it and the chlorine is going to raise the pH, um, there's no good science out there today on how much to add or any of those things. Um, I said waiting on VT research to get better guidance. Uh, this is Kelsey Piper, Dr. Kelsey Piper. She was at Virginia Tech, now she's at Northeastern. Uh, her and her grad students are working on a number of issues related to some of these topics. And so hopefully we'll have better information down the road to provide on that. Um, lastly, this is our front page I mentioned before. It's just privatewellclass.org. Um, if you have any questions, you can email us. There's an email address at the bottom. Uh, again, everything's free. Um, we're here to help you. Um, we are going to um, have a hotline that's going to be available uh, for well owners across the country. Uh, we have a phone number now. Uh, we do get calls nearly every day, I'd say. But um, this will be on EPA's private well page. And so we expect a lot more traffic. And we're putting together some information on that that will help people answer questions on their own. Um, that'll be available after April 1. And so um, that's what I have for presentation. Um, I, let me pull up the questions. Looks like we do have a few questions. So I'm going to get rid of that and pull this over. Katie or Sally, let me know if you can see that okay. It looks good. It looks good. Thanks. Okay, so um, can you specify one or more RO systems that will remove arsenic? My current uh, RO system is 14 years old and is becoming hard to get filters for. You know, if you go on um, any vendor, some, you know, a, someone, a treatment dealer that sells equipment, um, there'll be a range of these systems, RO systems for removing arsenic. They'll range from $200 to $2,000. And uh, again, the what you need to do is make sure that the one you pick um, is certified to remove arsenic. And you can go to um, the National Sanitation Foundation or Underwriters Labs web pages and uh, look up the information on the ones they've tested. And, uh, you know, I offhand, I we don't get into the details of that. And, you know, as, as kind of part of a state agency, we really can't. Um, promote one type of system necessarily. Um, but there's folks out there that can help you. You know, the Water Quality Association actually has a training program, if you will, or a accreditation program for treatment dealers. Um, it's, uh, it's a good thing because at least you have dealers who are going through ethics training and some of the things that, you know, are a big worry. Uh, you don't want to get sold treatment equipment that doesn't really work. And so um, on their web page, they list all the folks that have taken uh, and been certified through their program. And uh, you just search by your zip code, I think. And I'm sure you can find someone who can answer that question a lot better um, if you search on their list of treatment dealers um, that have you know, taken their certification program. Uh, or email me and we can talk more about it um, offline. Um, but I don't have a uh, particular RO system I'd recommend. Um, I'm just not in, I'm a groundwater hydrologist and an engineer, um, not a treatment specialist per se, um, just enough to be dangerous. Um, I have an older dug board well that has been tested over the last three months for coliform E. coli. It started out low for coliform and has increased over the last couple of retestings despite disinfecting the well, increasing the amount of disinfectant. Most recent test was positive and now E. coli, what would you suggest doing for the well moving forward? Um, 
Well, that certainly suggests you have a continuous source. So um, it also, you know, going back to how you have done your disinfecting, um, it's not about just disinfecting the well, right? It's also disinfecting all the pipes in your home. And so it's important to understand whether you've done that because if you just disinfected the well and didn't run water through all the pipes in your house, um, then that would suggest to me that you might have something like biofilm growing in your pipes and it's just getting worse. Um, I don't, and it could be if it's over the last three months, uh, depending on where you live, I don't know if there's a seasonal component. I know, so I grew up, as I mentioned, on a 14 foot hand dug well. It was always contaminated and we didn't know that growing up. I That's what I grew up on. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if you want to send us some pictures, I don't, I don't know if that'll help. I, you know, even among old dug wells, there's a lot of difference uh, in how they were constructed. Ours was brick lined, for instance, and uh, when it rained, our water was cloudy. So that's about the worst case. Um, but if it's, if the coliform and E. coli are getting worse then um, yeah, there's gotta be a reason for that uh, if you're putting chlorine in the well and it's still happening. So um, and it might be, a, this might be a good case where it'd be good to send somebody out, like from RCAP, they come out and look at your well, uh, no charge. I mean, they don't have a fee for anything. It's all through this grant. Um, that's probably the best information I could give you depending on what state you're in. So, um, so email us, it's info at privatewellclass.org. Um, are there recommended alternatives to PVC for service lines from the well to the house? PVC has been shown to leach different chemicals over time. Um, you know, there's different kinds of plastic. Um, I don't know all of those. Um, I'm, yeah, I, it's a, I'd have to look uh, that up and find the right person to give me a better answer because it's this is one of the cases where um, I tell folks all the time, if I can answer it, I can find an answer. Um, so if you can give us your information, I can certainly try to do that. But offhand, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I know there's certainly different kinds of plastic pipe besides just PVC. Um, but even, you know, even with lead pipes, if the water isn't corrosive, it's not going to leach lead. And so it may be the chemistry of your water uh, could change and that would affect whether there's any kind of issue with PVC. It's not about that it's been shown to leach over time. Like in a research study, it's about your water quality and how that might affect and interact with that pipe. Um, Cause that's, you know, the real world's a little different than um, a research project looking at the, the pipe itself. Um, how do you get to the resource mentioned earlier that allows you to convert the units of the parameter that was tested? Oh, Katie's already answered for me. Thank you, Katie. All right, that's what we have today. It's uh, two minutes till three my time. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And um, yeah, if you go on our webpage and click on webinars, you'll see the webinars we have coming up over the next few months. Um, hopefully this was helpful. And again, you can always email us at privatewellclass.org. Uh, we respond to everything we get and uh, you know we'll certainly try to help, um, help you as much as we can. All right, thank you. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, Katie.